Okay. I'm here. Sports fans, forgive us for the, uh, the the strange opening without any uh, volume. It looks like it's working now. I'm going to go check the, the uh, comments in a second. But anyway, um, welcome to the B-Ball Breakdown Live show. We got, I think we got our things all straightened out now. And we're ready to get into it and talk about the PBS system and what Mark has developed and how Allen is actually putting it on the court. Uh, it's been a great four weeks with great stuff going on. The last uh, comments and interactions, people learning about this. So I'm excited to be able to interact directly with you guys and uh, the people watching to answer questions. So make sure you get your questions up there, get them in the comments, and we're going to get there. Uh, before we do that, um, you know, let's just check in with Mark and Alan and, and see how you guys are doing and uh, any kind of feedback you've noticed over the last four weeks from uh, the comments or people commenting on Twitter or anywhere else. Well, After you, Alan. I would say, um, you know, since you've, since you've shared those four episodes, Nick, the interactions I've had is people um, reaching out to me on social media, private messages on Twitter normally, and they're generally um, they're generally questions around. Well, you know, the rule of three, three sounds really beneficial, uh, but how do you bring it to life, and how do you keep it alive? And you know, I'm getting a lot of those type questions. Are you worried about losing control? Um, I, I really see the benefits and the value of what you guys are talking about, but I find it difficult to 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 keep, to bring them alive in a practice session. So, I guess a lot of the questions or the interactions I've had are being questions about how to practically actually bring this to life and how to get it off the ground in effect. I think I've had a lot of interactions where people see the value of it. Absolutely, and I I have a feeling that's the big thing is when you're yeah. Talking, I, I, oh, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, it's interesting, Alan, what you said there is because it's it's the common trait with ed anybody that attempts these type changes in coaching behavior. Um, the common reason is because people have, have not gone through the correct process to embed it at the early stage and then put in a support mechanism to help keep it alive. The things we talked about, actually, and the, the, the last one you shared, um, which was yesterday, Nick, um, I've had at least 15 within two hours messages um, just saying, uh, I kind of, it starts to make sense now. That was a really useful um, ver uh, clip. What are we calling them? Chapters? <laughs> Series? Uh, that one was really, really useful because it, yeah, episodes, because it made me really connect with, oh, I can see I need to put in a structure in place to support me. And I think this is the key element. You can't just listen to something and go ahead. You've got to know. Absolutely. Um, we have a good question to start off, so let's get going with that because uh, Gavin W. Uh, put up in the comment section. And again, make sure that you guys uh, throw up your, any questions you have. We'll answer them right away. Now, he asks, what does the rule of three look like during a game? For example, soccer, if you can't stop the game. So, very simply, um, think of it as anything you're developing in practice. You apply it in the game when they're ready to apply it in the game. So, whatever they can do in practice under pressure, and, and the point is, are you applying pressure in practice well enough, often enough, real game pressure? Uh, and you'll identify what they can do. So, the things with soccer, with hockey, with many of the sports that you only have a half time and, and a few subs, the reality is they're ready when they're ready. So early stages, they may play very similar to they're used to playing, but it won't be a regression. They may start communicating a bit more and you may see a hand go up and a bit more acceptance, but it won't flow at the same level as practice. The same way if you practice something of a set piece or something live of a transition um, in practice, it doesn't come off always in the same way in the game. So it's just understanding, think of it as a new skill um, and don't, don't think, oh my God, it's not working in the game. You'll see moments of it, and the more and more you layer it, the more consistent you are in practice, the more it will ripple into game time. I think, let me, I'll add to that, Nick, a little bit. I think in basketball, it's, it's a really good question because in basketball, I think the nature of the sport allows me probably more reps in game to actually practice PDS principles because of the nature of the sport and the stoppages and the proximity of where I am with the players on the court. Like I can have an interaction or I can facilitate a player to player interaction quite regularly during the game because of the timeout factor. And I think as a basketball coach, it's actually that that can be a, a hindrance as well as a, a as well as um, a facilitator because the writing reflex kicks in early on. And when you have five timeouts per half, 
you know, between two or four timeouts in the first half and what is it, six in the second half. There is 10 opportunities for me early on to probably where I'm not getting this right because I'm jumping into those timeouts, giving the solutions, giving the answers and actually, you know, going with that writing reflex and helping solve the problems. I think as, as a soccer coach or as a rugby coach, when you don't have those timeouts or stoppages in play, it might actually lend itself to you a little bit better to, to actually facilitate these things, uh, these principles and concepts better. That's early on. Now, if you go to the stage I'm at now, I feel as a coach, these 10 periods of play or stoppages of play, timeouts in basketball, give me great moments of repetition to really sharpen my tool with the PDS way, the PDS principle. Um, and I, I, I've early on in my early on in my career with this, I often thought that actually sports like soccer and rugby probably have less chance to get it wrong because I felt I was getting it wrong a lot early on in my career. So I think there's 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 pluses and minuses with with that sport like soccer and rugby, for example. For sure. Well, here's another great question that David McCauley. If asked. I add to that, oh, Nick. Go ahead. So I, yeah, so if we break that down, if we're thinking about it, is what we do in practice, we need to let the game run in practice and we we need to start using that sideline hot one-to-one where we shout a player's name and they give us a thumb up or they give us a one word, the recognize the choice of the execution. So the more we, we get that interaction from the sideline based on where we can stand, based on the rules of the boxes, et cetera, of the, the, the coach at certain sports, we're always driving that point of we want it to be live. And then then we recognize our influential players and we get them in practice more to start asking the question and backing the players when something's not quite right and their behaves or the tactical choices. That three A's we talked about, that acknowledge, accept and act, is something that you you, you get your influential players to really work. And that that helps you in the game time. You know, I can remember Phil Jackson actually doing the acknowledge part where uh, Tony Kukoc, whenever he would, you know, screw up and they would just yell at him and get on him. And he finally decided on, you know, I remember reading about this. He's like, you know, I'm tired of yelling at you. If you are willing to raise your hand and show us to the bench that you you acknowledge that, okay, I should have done something else, then we won't get on you. And uh, I can remember that was probably what, in the mid 90s, that was revolutionary back then. <laughs> the idea that you would allow the player to say, my bad, and you can move on yeah. from that. Uh, but I think it was powerful, and I think it's kind of at the heart of what you're talking about. Yeah, definitely. If you look, there's a lot of video clips um, through my website that actually shows that live in action with different sports in rugby and in soccer. You'll see the players literally live. The coach doesn't even have to say anything. They're just watching for the hand up, another player to recognize it as they're running back. So we want that self-recognition unacceptable and exceptional. But it's the same thing with everything. Unless we really push it in practice and be consistent to allow players to get good at without us stopping play, they're never going to do it in the game. So we need to make practice more real at driving, developing the behaviors, not just driving the technical and tactical. Yeah, that's great. Well, I have another question for you guys. You ready? Um, let's see here. David McCauley. Oh, wait, we already asked that one. Uh, did we, already, we didn't already ask, how do we improve athletes' ability to step in at level two? I think, right, here's the new one. How do, how do we improve athletes' ability to step in at level two? How do we encourage, initiate athletes to give feedback to their teammates and strategies to help athletes receive feedback from their teammates. Does that make sense for the question? Yes. So part of rule of two is um, we, we make it very clear at the beginning. Is if someone is giving you feedback, one, it needs to be really clear and precise, specific, based on what we pre-agree and nothing else. And we still want the players to use the same needs type communication that we want the coach to do with the player. What I mean by that is we don't want players telling our players exactly what they did wrong and how to put it right. We need players to go, look, this was your your area there. You were the guys that were relevant to it. Talk to me about what your options were. We get them to do more of that type questioning relevant until the player can step up and go, hey, that was me. I should have done this next time I've nailed it. So it's about getting the players want to actually recognize the way you communicate will have an impact on the, the response you get but the oil also saying it too is you have to accept even if someone says it in a way you don't you don't like you have to accept because the intent is good so we can set loads of scenarios up 
where we we get players from the sideline and say right your job is to stand next to jimmy just ask jimmy some questions what type of questions can you ask jimmy if a player starts being negative like their intent is good but they're too negative we can take them to the side and say okay how effective was that remember desired impact no it wasn't coach so how could you have said that a bit differently then he shares it with coach go great next time can you show me that hand touch back in so all the time we're scanning and we're looking for those little opportunities to help develop the players on the side and that quick 30 second minute chat, push them back in. The next time we get the, we give them the thumb up. Great. Love that. So it's that positive reinforcement when they change. We just got to get players to recognize they're human beings. They've got good brain cells to recognize how did that go? Didn't go great. OK, so how could you have said that differently? Great. Next time. Show me. And it's this evolution of evaluation as we go. What I would add to that, Nick, is, you know, if you look along <clears throat> the dynamics within every team, you know, you've got players on one end of the spectrum who are very confident and feel and would, will flourish with this immediately. So I think back to two years ago, we had a player, the veteran within the team. And when, when we implemented this system and I was lucky, I had Mark with us a lot very early on in the season, probably most of the practices and games, pretty much the first few months. There was one particular player and he gravitated to this straight away. He saw the benefit of it, but he had been a 30 year old veteran who had played at a good level and he, he truly understood the value, understood the value and he brought it to life really well. Now he had downfalls and pitfalls with it because he valued it so much that he was fixing everybody's problem for them like a coach would in effect. So it became a little bit counterproductive. So we had to, we had to mold him in a different way or support him in a different way, actually, to where he would become take on more of a coach's role. All right, Danny, instead of fixing all these problems now, in these, in these short spurts, these small timeout periods, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, I actually want you to probe guys by asking questions. Don't give them the answer. So now you weren't – so guys at the back weren't able to hide because Danny was always going to give the answer. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have the player who's lacking confidence. You know, I look at some of our younger players who played in our pro team, 17 years old, and they're playing with a senior player like, like the player I just uh, talked about. They may lack a lot of confidence at the rule of two to actually step in and say um, and, and take control of, of and say something to what they see to have a desired impact on somebody else. That's not easy for a young player who, or a senior player who lacks confidence. So I think as the coach, you just have to be mindful of where they are on that journey. And, you know, not have the expectation that just because I put this particular concept in, that all 12 players in the basketball team will bring it to life. They're all at different stages of the journey. And Mark talked about already. They're ready when they're ready. So what's my job? What, what's, where's my part to play in this? Well, I have to be aware of where they are in that journey. And, it's, and what does that support look like? It looks like one-to-one -one support away from the court, potentially. It also looks like me being on the sidelines saying to Asher, Asher, what are you seeing there? He tells me, I'll say, go on, what you, well, how do you feel about stopping the practice right now, bringing the guys together 10 seconds, reset them, let them go again. I'm not ready for that, coach. All right, Asher, no problem. I'm not going to push you. How, and then I'll go back to him. All right, Asher, I'm going to divide everybody into three groups of four. How do you feel about delivering it to a group of four? Yeah, I'm, bit, I'm, I'm more comfortable with that, coach. And that's a stepping stone process. And all of a sudden, when he does it and his teammates see value in it, and I facilitate the practice that they accept and acknowledge the stuff he says, the confidence is flourishing. It's not long before they're all able to bring it to life. You know, the one thing I want to say about this when I first began to interact with you guys and listen to what you're describing was what made me so excited was this notion that you could develop a player who probably never had a voice in a practice and might spend the rest of his life being a very quiet and unassuming person that doesn't have that skill to take control or offer things. Uh, verbally and you could develop that and that is the most exciting thing for me to hear from anything and that doesn't even relate to basketball per se right it's, we're talking about empowering a player to to feel like they are, they're part of the process and, and speak and have a voice that's exciting to me mark can i can i ask you mark to, and nick mark, yeah mark can i ask you to speak on one thing on, that came Alan. up a lot actually with messages i was getting like can you just talk a bit about mark and shed some light on Where's the time a coach steps in so it goes from being the rule of two to actually the rule of three? Can you talk? Can you shed a bit of light about that one? Because I think it's closely related to this topic. And I think it's one of the challenges we have as coaches understanding when is the right time. Yeah, so it's based, it's always based on judgment, but let's not forget what judgment actually is. Judgment isn't some sixth sense, some 
some magical thing that happens. Judgment is based on your interpretation of experience and your confidence and your knowledge and your perception of the way you should coach. So judgment is based on, right, I'm now seeing at one. Do I know what I'm looking for at one? Am I confident, again, regular, regulating my state? Am I scanning effectively? Looking at the things you've pre-agreed in the non-negotiables, looking at what you've agreed success is, have you made that clear on your acceptable, unacceptable, exceptional? Yes, I have. I'm looking for it. I'm not seeing it at one. Now I'm literally, I'm going to give them time. Again, judgment based on where they are. So a novice at this, that could be 20 seconds before you're given another player a chance to spot it and, and interact with with people that are more advanced, you're looking at seconds. So this is again, it's early. So I'm giving them time. And I just have a go ahead. Can anyone see it? Right. Yes, they are. Okay. Let's now. I'm watching for how what the interactions like. Interaction. There is an interaction. It's not that effective. Now it's judgment of. Well, I'm going to let that go. Or that would be a good one to one for positive reinforcement. Love the interaction. What did you say? Okay. Did I see the acceptance? And the hand touch or the thumb up, and then did I see an action? No, I didn't. That's an opportunity for a one-to-one -one with that player. So we have – this is why we need to be effective at doing those short one-to-ones from the sideline. Just shout someone out, player first, player last. Okay, talk to me what happened over there. What do you mean, coach? Yeah, I'm interested. Did, did Jimmy said something to you. What did Jimmy say? Uh, right, okay. And remind me on the rule of two. What did we agree? Accept action. Okay, so how did you go with that? No, I didn't, coach. Okay, so – what could you do next time? Yeah, recognize, act. Can you show me that next time? Great. And then Jimmy, Jimmy, just run him in. Maybe next opportunity, Jimmy, come in. Game still going. What did you say there to Stevie? I said this. How did you say it? <laughs> well, I was direct. Okay. How did he respond? So your challenge is next time is how can you say it? It's going to have a greater effect. And you, do, you let him off the hook as well. What did we agree? Don't let him off the hook, coach. Okay, next time, show me. So it's these little interactions. Actually, you're not stopping play. Then you get to the point, right, no one is committing and no one's literally are non-negotiables. They're not doing it. I've given no one's seen it one, no one's seen it two. It's one of those dead moments. Right, now I step in. Do I call a reset if I pre-agreed what a reset is? Do I just go time out in your group, 10 seconds, guys? Or do I just say, guys, I'm resetting now commitment run to the sideline back in talk as you're running back in we go and i throw the ball back in i don't need to have a long discussion if it's still dead i may bring okay why have a as alan mentioned in one of the episodes why have i called a timeout and see if they can work it out okay so what's preventing you from being successful now what do we need to change how long do you can you tell me now or how long do you need right now so 10 seconds coach right 10 seconds we go again so it's always this thing. It's not like one way where I have to stop play. It's, it's actually how clear have you been on the non-negotiables? Are you scanning for them? How clear have you been on what the success criteria is? Do they really understand it and see the value? And then I'm looking for that. What's happening at one? If it's not there, who's seeing it? No one's seeing it. My other invention might be, right, I've got to go on the sideline. What's happening over there, John? Yeah, rule of it's not happening. Okay. Can I put you on? Can you sort it for me? Yeah. Okay, great. Show me. And you rotate them with another player. So there's so many little intricate, little subtle influences that start before you have to stop the play. And I think this is the huge difference. Alan's very good at this. Some other coaches I'm working with, they're really good at this. Where if you're from the sideline, you think, well, play's just going. And coach isn't doing a lot, but he's having little whisper chats with players. And they keep coming off and on, off and on. But it's kind of flowing. But I'm seeing a shift in the team. So that's when you know the, the coach is really confident on their judgment of what to do in what moment based on just looking for a step sequence of their scanning based on the non-negotiables and, and what we've agreed successes. So I'll jump in here because we have another good question I can throw, uh, I think, quickly to Mark uh, as a, a quick question. Kevin's Knights asks, at what age and at what sport IQ level should you start to implement this system? I'd, I've started at four years old. Um, which we've had great effect with. Generally, um, with most of the sports teams, though, they're starting five, six, seven. So there's no question you could put it in there. Remember, you change your language for the age group anyway, and you would do that as a coach anyway. But I, uh, a Canterbury tennis club, they had really young um, players, male and female. They had the, you know, the short nets. The attention span was really, really short. They were doing little games. So we had something as simple as, okay, our non-negotiable is you can't serve 
until the person has got both hands on the racket and doing the jump up in the air. So you let them know if they're not, and then if someone's letting you know, you do it, and then you can serve. Within, within an hour, we had players scanning the player on the other side of the net. So these are young kids, five, six years old, and then letting them, hey, show me, show me, and then they're jumping up now two rackets. Then they serve. And then we get them to come into net. Okay, how was that? And they go, yeah, yeah I had to call them once, but you were really good. Hand, show me the hand touch. They hand touch. They love the hand touch. So it's just understanding that the limitation of most kids is based on our poor judgment of what they're capable of. So what you see in front of you is based on the environments they've been in that's influenced their present behavior or what they perceive as a present perception of what they can and can't do or how engaged they actually are. They may be disengaged because that's they've only been told to hit a ball or something or listening to coach talk. So we've got to say, look, I can't judge a player based on who they are now because I haven't given them the type of experience and the tools and the patience to allow them to flourish. So you'll be really, really shocked. And everyone I've done this with from all age groups have come back and normally have said, Mark, can you show me? I don't believe it. I do half an hour of these players. And all of a sudden they're engaged, they're communicating, they're hand touching. So they're, if they can talk, if they're doing a sport, you can use this. Alan, I have a question for you from SB. Would you ask a player if they would do something differently if you as the coach needed to do the intervention in the player and they did not have the confidence to do it initially? Do, I guess, would you hand held, hold hold their hand a little bit more? Well, I think when you're when you're down to when you're talking about confidence, Nick, it's like how do you build it and where's the starting point? And it's different for different players. But I've already kind of briefly uh, talked about that. For me, a lot of one to ones, and I, I think we can't undervalue or undersell the power of one to one interaction with the players. And it doesn't have to be away from the court. Actually, it's, it's been scientifically proven that the most effective one-to-one happens in the environment that they're most comfortable in. For our guys, it's on the field of play, probably, instead of the office of the coach or in a, or in a classroom or in a setting away from the field of play. So I think in terms of the confidence issue, I wouldn't, I don't go to the, I don't go to either extremes. Like I think we talked about in one of the episodes that it's a sliding scale between ask, tell, tell them or ask them or share, you know, it's not, it's not one or the other. And I think that's what you have to be mindful where I fell down early on and where I see coaches struggle with the PDS way is you find out a bit about it and then you go completely to one extreme and you're all in with like, they're, they, you know, just asking, 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 sometimes they need to be told to help them. So again, it's a calculated judgment on, and this is what we talked about. So one, it's a needs based approach. What does that player need from me? this moment in time and that's a calculated judgment they actually your whatever you choose to do now i wouldn't go to either extreme if he's really struggling with something i would always try to guide it first before i give the problem before i solve the problem so it could be for example a, a tactical phase of play that they're struggling with well i'll try to find a way to question them and guide them so they actually solve the problem themselves so actually their learning is intrinsically, it's not extrinsic, extrinsically coming from me, that they're actually digging to find the answer. Why? Because it embeds a lot deeper. I think the science of learning is all out there telling us a lot about that stuff already, which fits, which aligns with what Marx built with the PDS way. So you're building a deeper level of understanding as to why you're doing what you're doing. If you look at it from a player's perspective, why? Because they're having to solve the problem. They're having to dig a bit deeper. Now, the, the levels and extremes I go to with that will differ from player to player. I won't go to one full extreme and, and really just, you know, do the, do the work for them, do the job for them. I'll have to find a way to actually facilitate this part of the practice so they're actually still trying to reach for the answer, find the solution. So it's a lot of guidance in a way. Yeah. You know, by the way, I, I just feel like the, the value of letting them uh, arrive at the answer uh, just seems so intrinsically I guess, the, I don't know what the word is better, optimal uh, for a long lasting uh, connection to what you, the, the skill or the lesson they're trying to learn versus just browbeating them into, you know, you know, lecturing, I suppose, uh, which is exciting. I th and I think that might be a little bit difficult for player, uh, for coaches to, to, you know, have that patience to some degree to, to do that. Uh, let me throw this one to you, Mark, real quick. Uh, when you recognize the player is unable to control their own state, what are some interventions you use to help them develop that skill? So I'm going to just link something to Alan said there on the previous question, then, then answer that one, Nick. Is Remember, the, 
the players, the coaches that are listening to us now will already have in their picture of their head players that they think, I ask them a question and they just look at me blank. So remember, we need to set up scenarios to make it easy for them to, to problem solve and self-review. One of the easiest ways to get someone to just stand and watch someone else, maybe something as simple as, let's agree what's unacceptable, acceptable, and exceptional in, in keeping width. Something as simple as that. So now we're going, well, that person's not great at self-reviewing. They're really just look at me, wait for me to give them the answer. So I take them to a side, okay, what are you seeing over there? Remind me what we said unacceptable wasn't exceptional. Could you just explain to me as if I didn't know? What's, so where are we right now? Oh, on the right, we're exceptional coach, unacceptable here. Okay, so what's the difference? Okay, great. So could you, if you're on there, how would you fix that? Great. So now... Without them having to think, oh, have I going to come up with the right answer? We're having a conversation and we're putting their picture out in front of them that allows them to watch stuff and come up with a dialogue between us. And then all of a sudden, that's a hand touch. That's that step. And we're looking for those little moments because our first stage is we want to be getting players to have a, a logical dialogue with them. And that's why we teach them the this, this self-review framework of what the choice is, what could you do differently, et cetera. But it's finding opportunities to make the dialogue easy. Then you nurture it into, okay, review what you just did over there. Talk to me about what that, if that makes sense. So just add into what Alan said there. And then linked into your question. Could you ask it again, Nick, to make sure, sure I'm going to answer it correctly? Yes. When you recognize a player is unable to control their own state, which I suppose has to mean like he's constantly losing his temper and he's just too yep. hard on himself. What are some interventions you use to help them develop yep. that skill? Right, so this is something that shouldn't be done on their own. This is something that needs to be shared with all the players and the coaches. It's interdependency. So what we need to ask them is have that conversation with them. So look, the reality is everyone will lose it at some time, even the best players in the world do. The key is, is, is identifying when you feel it happening early. So if it's a score out of 10, don't wait for you to get 7, 8, 9, 10 before you try and sort it out. Can you? What are your triggers at one and two? And give spot then some examples. You know when it happened over here, what was making you frustrated? What are your triggers? So I know a lot of people use that color thing of you know the gold, yellow, and the red, which is great to categorize it. But what we want them to really find out is I'm interested in what are the common things that really frustrate you or wound you up. So it may be identifying. We may not know this, but we may have made the wrong call with this player. It may be they get frustrated when other players don't commit to things, and then they get annoyed. It may be they don't like when th when referee does a poor call. They may be outcome generated, and what they're not doing is self-evaluating the choice and the execution because it didn't come off. Now they're feeling, I'm really frustrated because it didn't come off. Or it may be they've presented that because they've learned it from watching TV that when you don't do something well, if I vent and look like I'm really angry, that's what the pros do. So therefore, that makes me look like I'm better than I am. So what we need to do is have that dialogue to identify when you're at one and two, what are the things? Okay. So when you're at one and two, what stage are you at where you can actually self-manage it? Could it be that you know the players around you and you can just give them a little trigger right, I'm starting to lose it now and just reach out for a hand touch. Mm -hmm. If you can't self-manage it, can you just look at me or have you got one of the teammates and go, right, this is one of those moments and you seek for the hand touch. Is it one of those moments you go, right, I'm starting to lose it. I can't do it with my mate. So let's agree sub coach and he comes off and then we just have a little one-to-one -one chats just to help them reset and ground that support so you pre-agree the what ifs you identify where the source is and you start this agreement with them and then you support them through that journey so it's getting to understand it's natural everyone has it so let's let's identify and work together to help each other be the best we can be at one itself recognize when it's early what what are your triggers Okay, then where's your strategy of, okay, who have you got around you that can help? Let them understand. Let's agree what that looks like. And then if you if that doesn't work, I'm over here for you. So let's agree if we can do sub-coach and it's one of those moments. So it's always think of it as a new skill. It is. It's a soft skill. But have the dialogue. Don't hide for it. And then put in interventions. And then once you agree an intervention, you have to scan for it as a coach. And you've got to get the players to scan for it. So an example would be that needs to be at rule of three again. You're looking for it. It's a behavior. You have pre-agreed the what ifs. I now see Danny starting to lose it. We've pre-agreed that if he starts losing, he can't self-manage. He's going to reach out for a hand touch. If he's not doing it, one of his teammates need to and go either say pineapple. It's one of these times or next 
in the present or what's next, whatever it might be, whatever we've pre-agreed the dialogue. And if I'm not seeing that, then I need to step in. And it may be right. If that doesn't happen, let's agree. I step in, call you up and go, okay, so it's one of them moments. Okay, talk to me. Where are we? So it, it's it's whatever we pre-agree, we have to scan for and we need to support because otherwise it's just a chat. But it's it's an important chat. Can, can, I, can I give an example of what Mark's just talked about, but reverse engine, but flip it actually? Because I have a really good example from this year, probably three, four, well, just before Christmas. And I have a great example from the European Championships about three years ago, which I shared with you already on one of the episodes, I think. But it, the same principle, Mark, applies to the coach, me as the coach. So I'm putting a support system in for the players to support the players and for me to support the players. But also what has been the game changer for my coaching to coach efficiently and effectively is I've put a support system in where the players can help me to be the best version of myself. And a, a great example and quite a succinct example is this year, just before Christmas, one of our American imports recognized that my, tri I, I, my triggers, he recognized my triggers actually, which was brilliant. And it showed the gr our growth together as a coach player relationship. He could see my emotional state building up and he could, he recognized my triggers and he, he ran past me on the court and he said something like, coach, this, we got it. Don't worry. It's cool. What he was trying to do is actually recenter my emotional state, but it didn't work. And I remember him subbing himself out of the action and he came over to me and offered me his hand. He put his hand out to give me a high five. And again, to reassure me, coach, we got this. Be patient. It's all good. We got this. And he didn't, I, I will say, and this was my weakness, when he ran past me on the court and he, he, he tried to recenter me with his voice. He, he recognized running back down on defense. It didn't have the effect because he could see me pace in the sideline. He subbed himself out of the action and came over and offered me his hand. It was a touch. And I can tell you that the touch, the high five, centered me, really brought me back to the, the emotional state I needed to be in. And I said after the practice, we're walking out of practice after, I said, AJ, I appreciate you today. I appreciate you every day, but you helped me tonight in practice a lot. And I and I didn't I didn't go to a state that I that I don't want to go to. He helped me to stay to be the best version of myself. But it, it took him acknowledging and recognizing my state, which I thought was brilliant. It was it was one of the one of my most memorable moments from the season, actually. And and I shared with you already the story about the European Championship, so I won't repeat it again. But I just thought it was important, Mark, to share that actually it works both ways players influencing coaches to be their best version as well. Yeah, I, I want to jump in there too because I had the same anecdote uh, in, in a game where I would get so angry and I'd be up and yelling and screaming. And I know and at one point, the one of my, the, the assistant touched me and it was almost like all of that energy or that anger that I had was like electricity that got grounded. It went shot through me, through his hand down on the ground and it just disappeared. And, I, and it was weird. It was so startling to me when it happened. I was like, you know what? Just touch me when you see me doing that or you know, I didn't do it for the players but I had my assistant coach do that and I it was it was and this was a long this is like the 90s I discovered this um, it was just like it was one of those revelations where uh, it's so important not only to have the player be able to regulate but the coach and uh, this notion of touch which you guys bring up all the time is so, is really powerful and uh, I'm, I'm almost getting emotional hearing you describe that scenario Alan just now because like imagine in the movie Coach Carter, <laughs> if uh, Timo, I think his name was, decided to be like, Coach, we got this and like high fived him to try and calm him down. Like it, he would have been, I think the coach probably would have decked him. But uh, imagine being able to do that and the, and the progress you can make. Uh, I think it's just, uh, it, it's exciting in the sense that you, that's the way you can get better play out of, your, out of the team in general. Can, can I add one more thing to it briefly, Nick? I think, I think, um, Public, the perception. Let's acknowledge it because the perception can be that that can be that can be perceived as actually soft coaching. Like you are the coach, you should be taking control. It's not it's not the player's job to keep you emotionally regulated. Right. However, I will tell you now that that is one of the hardest things I've ever done with this with these PDS principles is actually stand back, take a strong look in the mirror, and ask myself: Am I effective? Am I the best possible coach I could be? And can I be that coach without the without the assistance and help of the players? The answer is no, because they I'm dependent on the players. My my ability to coach effectively is completely dependent on how they perform 
or how much they commit to the stuff I'm asking them to do. Let's 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 go with the word commit more than perform, because I think perform can be perceived to do with results and outcomes, and that's not my angle on this. So I think involve, uh, involving the players in the journey, in your journey as a coach, is an absolute no-brainer. Uh, Mark Mark has taught me loads. I've learned loads from Mark. I've learned loads from courses. I've never I've yet to learn more from something other than the players. They've taught me more than anything else. And when you use EDS principles with players, that concept, that process be tenfold because there's no fear. Players don't fear what they say to you. You have given it, you're, you're getting a, you're getting the authentic and the, the purity of what that player thinks and feels. And that's a game changer for my development, has been a game changer. Uh, we have a lot of great questions, so I kind of want to try and get through them as many as I can. So uh, do you want to add to that, Mark, real quick? Or? Yeah, the only quick thing I'd say is that, remember, as a coach, you're, you're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. So if coaches think, well, I shouldn't be accepting any um, feedback if I'm, my state is good. Well, if, you, if you're part of the problem, you are unacceptable. So you need to find a strategy to sort yourself out. And part of the strategy is external support. The last thing I'd say there is remember the other element we need to be mindful of is some people aren't aware when they start to lose it. They're so caught up in it, they're not aware, so therefore they won't be able to self-regulate. So therefore they need an external intervention anyway, but it has to be pre-agreed. This is a key thing. Absolutely. Well, let's get to our next question, which would be, uh, here's an interesting one from a player from Subak. Hey coach, I'm the point guard of my team and the captain as well. I used to play as a shooting guard, so I never had to lead my team. I'm not used to calling the plays and leading my teammates. How do I develop this? Interesting. Uh, uh, Alan, you want to grab that real quick? Well, I would say, you know, if you look at positions within the game, and, and I don't know if Mark has picked up this or not. He, he, I would say he hasn't. But traditionally, he hasn't because of the environment, the basketball environment he's been has been the environment I coach in predominantly. But yes from a basketball coaching point of view point guards are generally known to be the floor captain as we say or the floor leader or the coach on the court that that has been debunked completely and with the teams i've coached and if i look back on the last two years the most vocal and what basketball coaches consider the coach on the floor has actually been a center two years ago he was the center of the team and last year was the power forward. They were effectively what people would describe as your point guards on the floor in terms of that leadership voice as it's termed. But it wasn't, it's not exclusive to one person. Like these principles and concepts are something that you're trying to bring, bring alive to everybody in the team from your so-called number one player all the way down to your 12th player. And I'll say this actually, during the course of a game, because of how we set it up, the players on the bench, those seven subs, are cognitively more engaged from the assistant coaches than the players on the floor. So player seven, five, five through, or six through 12, those subs, they're constantly being challenged by the assistant coaches, like a hot review in the moment. And the moment that I call their number to sub them into the game, one of the jobs of the support coaches, which is traditionally known as an assistant coach, is to go to the bench with that player and just get a reminder of what success looks like for him now when he goes on the court. Straight away, he's got to be clear about what success looks like for him when he goes down the floor. When the player that comes off the floor sits down the bench, we leave him alone for a few seconds, and then the assistant coach goes down to him, and same process. And it's as simple as, and at this stage, it's as simple as, talk to me, what are your thoughts? And they're given a hot review of, of their last three or four or five minutes on the floor. So this is not tied to a point guard. This is not tied to a position. This is this is positionless. They talk about positionless basketball. PDS is positionless. It's for players one through twelve on a basketball team, for example. Mark, do you want to add to that? Can I add to that, Nick? Please. Yes. What was the name of the player, Nick? What was the name of the player? Uh, this was. That's a um, question. Uh, Oh boy, I cannot. Oh, here we go. It is uh, Subak with three B's in the middle. S U B B B A K. <laughs> oh. Okay, well, here's the key you need to have a conversation with your coach. So there's some. I'm going to throw 
some questions that you know, which you can just self-reflect right down. The first thing is, is are you confident within the game management of what your role is and your strategies of making choices live? If you're not, let the coach know, let other players know you need video footage. C coach, you need to give me scenarios so I can start leading, make decisions on the court. You also need to, to identify who are the players around you that are supporting you within this role and, and agree you need to run plays, live five-on-five five plays, to allow you to develop your skill and confidence in this. But it stems from you need to be confident in your game management of the choices you're going to make live, not just the set pieces. And then develop a, a dialogue with the players around you and understanding you. It is unacceptable for you to be on your own. You need to develop rapport and understand and read the players around you so you feed off each other. So you have to have a conversation with a coach to recognize where your strengths are, where your weaknesses in, in either your volume or what you're saying, how you're saying it, or your understanding of game management, and then set scenarios up in practice to allow you to grow in those areas. Fair enough. Well, let's move on to another question here, which is, um, oh boy, I highlighted it and now it's, um, here we go. Um, let's try this one from Brian Carella. Hey, coach, um, how would you go about teaching players to coach themselves and their teammates without creating tension between them? Some players decline to listen to their teammates. And I know we probably circled around this notion, but this is pretty specific. Can we drill down into that and how you assuage, you know, the, in the strife between, you know, players who might perceive themselves as being better than others? And how dare you try and tell me how to do something? Uh, Alan, you want to jump into that? Well, I think it starts with how you set your stall early on and, and what does and the definition of what does success look like for this team this season. And, uh, you know, when you start with that approach as to having a discussion with the team about, well, what's going to make us the more effective, high performance team we can be this season? And what's that going to take? What's that going to look like? And they all say, well, we'll be doing X, Y and Z, which ultimately comes back to we'll be making great decisions collectively as a group. Well, we say, well, let's let's OK, if that's how, if that's what it looks like, let's peel it back. What do we need to do? What does each person on this team need to do in order to be the best version of ourselves to achieve that goal? And when you start off with defining what the success criteria looks like for the team and then you introduce the tools that we've spoke about already and what and what the value is of them and they understand the value that goes a long way towards those conflicting situations you can have during the season. Now, from my experience, that doesn't mean there's not going to be conflict between two players. But what it does is it allows you to reconnect them as the coach. I can remember going back over to two players and saying, hey, Nick, just remind me what we agreed success would look like for this team when we started this whole process. And it would be, well, yeah, rule, uh, resets and effective communication and all that stuff's part of it. Great. Tell me what's effective communication, Nick. Well, whether I, whether I agree or disagree with what my teammate's saying, effective communication means I have to acknowledge that he's saying something to me and I have to accept it. And then if I disagree with it, we can have a discussion, we can have a discussion after, but not during the flow of the game. We've got, to, we've got to persevere and get on the same page. So it's about, for me, it's about reconnecting them back to what we defined as success at the start of the season, which is why, Nick, I start off every practice the way I start off every, I start off every season the way I do with those, that whiteboard activity. Because I'm not telling them about stuff. I'm bringing to life that it's a collaborative, it's an interdependent approach to how we will perform as a team. It's not a bunch of individuals who are better than the other 10 guys in this team who are going to get it done for us. We are dependent on each other. And in, in order for us to achieve that success criteria, we have to work collaboratively. And what does that look like? And now you're down to effective comms and, you know, committing full, full commitment to the choices you make. And, and you're down to all those principles we talked about. But the reconnection to that is what's important when those moments of conflict arise, and they will arise, and there's nothing, it's, it's absolutely fine. Mark, what, I'm quite curious, how do you avoid creating a situation where the entire practice is just talking? <laughs> you're just constantly having to, you know, to try and do all the things you're describing, and it almost feels like you get stuck, but you never get to do any action. So how do you manage that where you can get what you need to get done, have that the communication, and then still get plenty of reps? Well, it's interesting. Actually, the opposite happens, Nick. They actually end up playing more and the quality and intensity goes up um, just because coach can't stop and chat for nothing. Um, but linking into how we can make that easier is we link about the disagreement now is what a coach has to be. There's loads of strategies that I can't share on here, but I'll share a couple. 
the coach needs to make sure every player understands what are the way we play is and, and how we see certain situations. So we go, right, we've got four or five choices of that. These are okay. These are okay. And then they start. the coach has to start looking early on to read his game. And that's where the whiteboard stuff Alan talked about is really great on. Who understands that type of play, that type of situation? Who's making the good choices? Who's got a good depth of understanding? Then you start in little pockets of play. You go, right, Stevie's going to lead on this. Stevie, can you lead on this? And Stevie, the player, leads on that. So all of a sudden now, the players recognize, hang on, coach has said Stevie's leading on this. We have to listen to Stevie. The rule of three also connects with that. You have to accept. If there's a disagreement, you still accept in the moment. And then coach can step in or a little one-to-one -one when they come, okay, what was the disagreement, guys? Well, I think we should do this in this situation, this. Go, look, you're both right. For this particular game, we're going to play this next team. We're going to go for this way. So we're going to go for Stevie's way. Danny, you're exactly right, but we're going to go for this one. So coach can be in there until we've got players doing that and actually realizing there's many ways to do something, but we've got to agree away in the moment. Then you up the pressure, you get the live play moving. So now they're having to realize, look, you can't argue because if you're arguing now, that's one or two seconds wasted where we should be committing to a choice. So you can't be arguing about the choice live. You've got to go for it. And then we can review it in practice. So we get to know each other. We get to know how we play. We get to know the flow. So there's many things a coach needs to do. Back to scanning again to identify who are the people that the coach is confident is saying the right stuff. And you give them permission to lead certain things. So you're developing little pockets where people have players have to listen to players, have to accept. And the rule of three helps that as well. Uh, great, that's a great way to describe it, and, and it's exciting. Now, here's the thing that you might notice if you're watching this and trying to eat, learn. This takes a long time. This is not easy. And it might even take having to listen to this a couple of times to fully absorb what's going on. I know for me, it, that's how it felt. And after an, even a couple of times in interacting with you guys over the past few weeks, uh, it, it starts to get clear. It's just sort of osmosis. I'm not sure. So if you're watching this and it does feel sort of uh, overwhelming, it's just a question of, stopping maybe listen to it again and then you can always reach out to alan and mark you can see on their uh, twitter accounts i think it's safe to say we're not finished yet but you you guys both respond to people who mention you on twitter right yes absolutely yeah yeah so that's a great way to reach out to them directly to get some more and then who knows if you're running a team and you want even more formal uh you know um uh, help or, or uh, con consultation, then certainly you can reach out and, and they can do that as well. Let's see if, um, oh, here's another couple of questions we have. Uh, NBA Spotlight says, uh, let's see, how do, how do you coaches deal with the disease of me? Lots of players have egos and are more worried about their personal gains as opposed to team success. Individual agendas tend to be detrimental. Now it kind of folds into what we just talked about, but I think there's, a, there's another offshoot of this right where we're talking a little bit about you know the, you know them wanting to be the star and that kind of thing so um you know i don't know who wants to jump on this first but how do you deal with that in the confines of the pds system it's um interesting one of the first teams i worked with, the fully professional team was in 99 2000 it was a super league rugby league team and the coach came to me and said mark i've got a problem with the team i have Alfie Langer, Alfie Langer, if you don't know Alan Langer, he was um, the world's best rugby league player. He was a legend in Australia where rugby league's big. Uh, and then we've, and he was on big money. And then we had junior players that were on hardly any money and then players in the middle. And he says, you know, how can I get these people working together and turning up and doing the same commitment, understanding they've got totally different wages and they're not always going to get picked, still be the stars are going to get picked. And how do the stars not being arrogant and lazy in practice? So it all boils down to back to facilitation. What is taking any player and if you recognize as unacceptable traits and behavior, you don't challenge them because often they're a product of the behaviors and the culture that are in in the past. What we've got to recognize is, okay, for you to get the best contracts, if a contract is their stimulus, if that's what comes out with them, in the moment, what will... What gets you the best contract? Well, me playing to my best, me getting good moments in a game, good minutes. Yeah, but you performing to your best. Okay. In order for you to perform to your best, can you compare anyone in the moment now in your team? Because you might be comparing yourself to someone in another team you don't practice with, you not even play. That's your competition right there that you may not even see till it comes to contract time. So what's the only way you can be ready for contract time? And then they start to make 
well, for me to be the best I can be. Right. So what would the best you can be in practice now as you as an individual within your SNC, your nutrition? And now let's talk about how you interact with the players on the pitch because you need to get the best out of the other players for you to shine. So what would that look like on the pitch? What would that look like in training? What would that look like before training? You've got knowledge these junior guys haven't. How can you help them make sure they turn up right with their feet ready, their trainers ready, their hydration ready, and their warm-ups nailed? Because that's the type of player that's going to get the big contracts. So everything goes back to identifying their lighthouse. And then what are the facilitators that go back to, in the moment, what's the best they can be? Because they don't know what's coming season time. And then you just start connecting that dialogue. And when the culture like Alan and many others have, people enjoy actually helping people around them because that's the enjoyable time. That's when they start to realize, I'm enjoying training now. I've never enjoyed training before. I've worked harder than I've ever done. But actually, I get a buzz from practice now. And we bring them back to ground. We bring them back to being present in a moment, being the best they can be, which a junior player that may be the slowest, may be tactically and technically the weakest, they can still be the best they can be compared with another player that can't cruise, even if they're the best in the team, because they need to be the best they can be. And how can they get the best out of the other players? So often it's uh, not losing or forgetting about the elephant in the room. Have the conversation, have the dialogue, have intrigue, nail it down to what would it look like in the moment? And then how can you help me help the others to help you shine? And that's like a shortened version. But does that make sense, Nick? Absolutely. Uh, Alan, do you want to add to that at all? Yeah, I mean, I, I won't repeat what Mark said, but he's pretty, he's pretty much described the process I've had to go through every year with the players we get because my my situation is here with the club we we bring in a couple of import players every year from overseas two from the u.s and probably three or four from europe um, and we mix them with domestic players for our second level pro league here so they often come in with one thing on their mind is to, to generate you know a better contract next year somewhere else in a higher division make more money so you kind of have to reconnect them to actually okay I, i'm going to go i'm going to help you with that I'm not against you having that motive. There's nothing wrong with you having, you should have that motive. I think it's healthy because it shows that you want to play at a higher level and you want to get better. But it's it's redefining in their head what's, what's going to get them there, what they need to do. And the only thing, and Mark's already talked about the process, but the only thing I would add to it is, um, is I use a lot of video for them to actually see and prove what does the best version of you look like in each moment. So... You know, practice video more than game video. Like, we, we probably review more practice video than we review game video because it's in practice that you bring alive the things you want to bring alive in game day. Most coaches, are, or I used to anyway, spend a lot of time on the game footage video. But I'm actually spending more time now on practice footage video because that's where the game changer takes place. That's where you bring this stuff to life. You don't just switch it on on game day all of a sudden. So, you know, a, a lot of our stuff is one-to-one -one video with the print with the process mark has just talked about in detail yeah absolutely i got a really good question here i want to throw out there um from brando b30 he says have either of you as coaches experimented with meditation or various breathing techniques as a way to try and recenter a player or even yourself in times of great pressure uh i guess it's for you alan i haven't used that breathing techniques but the principle is the same so mark mentioned the word a moment ago pineapple so it, the principle behind that is, and I haven't used the word pineapple, but Mark's used it with other coaches successfully, but we've taken on the principle. So what is the principle? What is the concept? It's actually finding out like the one player I had this year was a great opportunity for me to sharpen my, to, sharpen my tools with these principles. He challenged me massively. Why? He was incredibly emotional, incredibly emotional with referees, with the weather in the UK, with the fact that practice was at seven o'clock in the evening. It didn't matter. The, there was always something. And it, he challenged me a lot to, to manage my emotional state with him, actually. But I, so I sat down and I said to him, okay, what's going to make you a better, better, what's going to make you a better version of yourself? And or what are you struggling with most? And we had an open dialogue discussion about it. So he said, he's, my emotional state, his emotional state is his barrier to, to being better. So I said, okay, well, well, what, what's going to, let, let's unpick what's going to help you with that then. So we ended up putting a system in place where I would use the word blindfold. So we'd be in the middle of a practice session or a game, and this player is running up and 
I'm seriously and my coaches to recognize call against them or whatever, or his teammates threw him a bad pass. And you'd hear me shout from the sideline, blindfold, blindfold. And that was just to reconnect him to the conversation, the one-to-one -one intervention, the support strategy system we put in place. It was simply just to reconnect him to the player he said he wanted to be. It was just to reconnect him to the player he 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 would, didn't want to be, and the blindfold represented this. So when you get emotional, you so great. So he we that's the approach we took. It wasn't a breathing technique. It wasn't a reset, but it was using something else that he could connect to to enter himself during live play. Yeah, you know what's funny is that when I do my shooting drills, a lot of times I try and eliminate the head from the shot, in, meaning if you're in a, an emotional state or something's bothering you, that could lead to misses. So we used to do as they're shooting nonsensical words, and it almost you know to be funny, pineapple would have definitely been one of them, or hot dog. We used to yell, out, we didn't yell out anything, and it was it was remarkable to see how when you could kind of disconnect that and maybe hopefully lead to some sort of like a, a laugh or that kind of thing. Even though you think there's no way they're going to make that shot because they're almost like giggling when they're shooting, they would actually end up making as many, if not more. And it seemed to, and I wonder if Mark, you could connect with this somehow. It did seem to eliminate the negative thoughts that could creep into your performance and cause you to miss shots. Well, if, if you think about everything we've talked about there, going back to that question is what we want is a player to be present in the moment, scanning opportunities and threats. When a player's, the whole thought is focused on, right, where are the opportunity threats? They can't be thinking about negativities because they're in the present. And that's exactly where we want someone to be. So all the techniques that we're looking at are facilitators to help someone be present. So when I work with the elite pro teams around the world, they'll all have at least one psychologist. Some of the players have more. So what I do, which doesn't happen often enough is to identify a, a close relationship with the psychologist and the coaches of, okay, don't talk about the confidential stuff, but if you've shared with a player, you've shared with them a meditation technique or whatever other technique that you want to use, and the player is finding that useful, the psychologist needs to share that with the coaches because the coaches need to know, so how can I support that player with that strategy and that technique that seems to be working for them and not just have it where the player knows about it, the psychologist knows about it, but the coaches don't. So this is that collaborative support. So I always say to anybody, look, if you would like to explore that, let's give it a go. But if you're going to give it a go, let's really commit to it. What support do you need from me or anybody else to help you keep that alive, to give it its best shot to see if it's effective or not? So my, my principle is I never rule anything out because even if things that um, science has shown that there is no evidence, if it's a placebo effect and it works, then great, let's use it. Because the reality is, is it helping somebody? Well, then we can use it. Absolutely love it. Well, I tell you what, we're kind of running to the end here uh, of, with um, some amazing questions. This definitely goes to the top of the list of, as far as uh, quality questions in the, in the uh, comment section. Also, there, are, there have been some questions that sort of asked from uh, an answer we already gave, and they asked it. So, you know, watch it again, and you'll get your answer, even if we didn't address it directly in the comments. Um, I, you know, I think maybe we have one more question we could uh, address here before we go. Um, and I think it, it was touched upon earlier, but let's just throw it out there. Uh, it said, how do you each feel about five on O dry offense versus five on five live situations in order to enable player feedback and a strong line of communication between a coach and his or her players? Uh, we talked about, I think you, it came up briefly, but let's maybe in a, in a more focused way on that live versus the, you know, just uh, no defense uh, walking through stuff uh, and not simulating games. Uh, Alan, you want to jump on that first? Yeah, there's an element of there, there'll always be an element of practice where it's a learning outcome. And, and what Mark has defined with PDS is learning outcome versus performance outcome. And, you know, it's absolutely fine. I, I, I do. I, I use in not every practice, but early on in the season when we're putting in new content, you know, you're in the phase of practice. That's the outcome is actually going to be a learning outcome. So you as a coach are going to be directing whether it's 2 on 0 5 on 0 a set play offense, there is an element where you're going to be talking more than they are. And that's fine. And that's absolutely okay. But I think that, and not to go off on a tangent to what this topic is about, I think the challenge of a master coach or the, or the more experienced coach is not to stay too long on that segment. 
like you've got to make a good judgment of when it's time to move on now and we can start repping this uh, new content with defense and it could be advantage offense five on four four on three and then build it up from there but you once you put that pressure of defense in you're straight into a performance outcome to a point but again it's recognizing when are they ready for that and mark used the phrase earlier they're ready when they're ready and i think that's the challenge of all coaches when do i move to that phase when are they ready how do i know they're ready and it's it's a lot of the hot reviewing that Mark's already talked about, so I won't repeat it. And it's you scanning, it's you stepping back and scanning to see, is it at a level where I've deemed it and they deem it as acceptable and we can now start to rep it against defense. And now you're into the last phase, I think, which is aggressive competition. What would it be like on match day? So that's a short answer, really, Nick. Mark, do you want to pick it up? Yeah, I'm really pleased that someone's asked this question, Nick, because it, it can it can allow me to share something to get clarity with so much out here at the moment. At the moment now, game-based constraints-led is becoming very favorable with some coaches, but it's causing a conflict with other coaches because some of those are, are purists saying you should never do a drill. So there's two things with that is. We need to understand a perception when someone says drill, what is that? But we need to understand that any great coach will use the whole spectrum. So constraints is fantastic. You need to understand it. You need to know when to use it. However, it, with using constraints where you manipulate the environment, which we should be doing all the time anyway to extend difficulty, pressure, make it easier, make it harder in live play, there still comes a time when you could spend 40 minutes getting a player to work something out using constraints, or you can do it in a breakout in two minutes where you go okay let's just walk through this guys let's just make sure you have an understanding of role and what could happen here right now you know that back in to the live play and it's then connecting with and now I mentioned it there and we mentioned it a little bit in the episodes is letting players understand in this phase which could be 10 minutes 15 20 minutes this is a learning phase guys so they understand, look, it's not going to be hard on full speed. It's about us understanding and learning something. It might be a play, my positioning, whatever it might be, reading someone else. Once you get it, guys, let me know when you've got it or I think you've got it. Now we go in performance, which is we put it straight into a different levels of pressure against an opposition. The key thing is, is we've got to make sure if we're going to put in an opposition, we need to do that as early as we can when they're ready. But also we've got to make sure the opposition is real. So here's another problem too many teams do. And I'm looking even at pro levels and national level, Nick, that I've worked with across the world is sometimes they go, right, we're doing this in attack. Soccer does this a lot. This phase of training, we're doing offense. And no one is scanning for the quality of the defense when it's offense. So the offense will look great. And they go, well, it's against opposition. But because the defense is unacceptable in their choices, their commitment and their communication, of, of course the offense is going to look good because no one's scanning for what's acceptable, unacceptable in the defense. So we've got to make sure it's not just about opposed play. We've got to make sure who's looking at which team. We've got to make sure, are they pursuing excellence? Is their level of commitment, choices, decision-making, communication acceptable? But if people aren't getting it and whatever you're manipulating the environment and not getting it, stop, run a small drill if you want, run a little breakout for two, three minutes and put them back in again. So it's understanding. I'm not one to say you can't do this or you can't do that, but I'm one and Alan knows this. I'm going to challenge a coach and quantify why you're doing that then. So my aim is I want them to be in live play. I want it to be contested, but I want the contest, a quality contest. You need to be scanning both sides, nominate a coach to, or an injured player to look at this side. You look at this side. But we've got to understand, don't just keep doing it if it's not working. If it's not working, stop and, and give them the answer. Work for a little drill right now. You've got it. it. might be two minutes we go again. Don't just flog a dead horse because you think I want to be constraints led. And don't just do drills because you're just learning drills or you've watched off YouTube. If it's not adding value, if you should be in live play and you're doing a drill, why are you doing a drill? So it's it's more quantifying why you're doing these things. And don't just do it because you've seen an NBA team doing it or you've seen a you know a Super League team or an American football team do it. It doesn't matter. You need to understand the value of what you need to do in the moment. And that's, again, good coaches, good judgment. Well, this is a fascinating conversation. It really is great information. I know everybody in the comments also really took a lot out of this, and I can't wait for it to be posted as a regular video where you can watch it as many times as you like after this, and we'll reach a whole other segment of the audience. So 
really great stuff. You guys can always find um, Alan and Mark uh, on their Twitter handles, and there'll be uh, links in the description below. And um, you know, I, I can't I can't tell you how much I'd like to thank you for what a great experience this has been over a four week uh, you know uh, discussion over of what you guys do and culminating in this live show with just really fantastic stuff. Thank you guys. Oh, it's been a pleasure, Nick. Uh, it's really good just getting it out there to a new audience and breaking down. I hope if we've done nothing, we've got your viewers to connect with actually need centered is real. It's not soft. It's hardcore. And it is it is an added value way beyond the traditional. Just tell the to the players. Players have a far greater ability and make decisions and back themselves far more than we give them credit for. But we we need to be investing in ourselves as coaches, and we need to be patient, changing the behaviour of the players. Don't just give it a go for half an hour and say it doesn't work. It takes time. But if you invest that time in the behaviours in yourself and the players, you will be a different different team within the season. I guarantee it. And that's why on the website we've got. Uh, live support for teams, live support for coaches, online support for coach teams that take them through this journey. Because I, I think the one thing that's missing in sport, Nick, we don't do enough good coach mentoring, supporting coaches to support them and hold them accountable when they're developing these skills. Asking someone to listen to this and go and do it is a big ask. And I, I think we're going to fall over doing that. So make sure, even if it's not me, you find the right person or Alan, Find the right person that can really support you through the change to give you the answers and challenge you to really commit to it. Because we've been employed, whether we're a volunteer or we're getting paid big money, to get the best out of the players. So we owe it to ourselves to be the best we can be to impact on them. And I think that's the most important thing people have taken from these conversations. Well, thank you so much, guys, for coming on. Thank you guys for joining us in the live show. And if you've watched the other episodes, uh, awesome. If not, check them all out. And uh, don't forget, sports fans, at B-Ball Breakdown, we're not a channel. We're a conversation. You in? Are you in, guys? We're in. Absolutely.